For those of you just tuning in, we are talking with Ben Sherman. He is author of the book Medic, the story of a conscientious objector in the Vietnam War. In addition to yourself, the other main character in the book is a guy named Smitty, who the reader just falls in love with. He's just like the perfect buddy in so many ways. Can you talk about him? Yeah, Smitty was a lifer, uh, Mississippi, came from a very poor family. Lived, lived, their family lived literally right on the Mississippi River. Um, didn't, didn't talk much about his family growing up. I got the idea that, that he was, um, he left home pretty early. He, he had been a Marine for uh, a number of years, uh, probably 10 years, I think. Um, then had done a couple hitches in Vietnam, and his entire platoon uh, was wiped out in a, in a battle in the north, and he was injured uh, severely, uh, one of the few survivors of this uh, just being overrun, and was shipped out, shipped home, and he was so badly um, beat up that they, the Marines just released him. He'd, he'd been in the service all his life, literally, all his adult life. And they discharged him, gave him a medical discharge, and he couldn't argue with it. He went back to Mississippi, was there for six or eight months, I think, and just um, and just couldn't stand it. I mean, he, he was married, he had a wife at home and all, and but, he, you know, it was just she agreed with him that he needed to be back in Vietnam. And... He um, so he he went to the army recruiter and said, "Here I have these ten ten years behind me, or ten or twelve. I can't remember exactly how many it was." And and he said, "Can I can I get in the army?" And the and the recruiter uh, said, "If he could pass the physical test, he could he could get in." He passed with flying colors. He said something about. I, I limped my way around the two mile run and, and did it better and and did it better than the first time I had done it in the service because he was in such great shape. But and he had recovered, you know, he's a guy that, that um lift weights and do everything he could to get himself back in physical shape. But he was a um gunnery sergeant or something in the in the Marines. He he was not a medic. And um he had done a bunch of medical he had acted as a medic when he was in the Marine. There were times, he said, where we just didn't have enough corpsmen, and, and, I, and I liked that. So when he went into the Army and he was able to choose his um, MOS, he said, I'd like to do, I'd like to go to medic. And so he actually went through medical training, uh, which is for a, a lifer, you know, to go through a platoon with a bunch of, of recruits is, is a lot to ask. But he did. He went through this medical training and got himself a, uh, taught correctly uh, most of the stuff he already knew and then he showed up in Vietnam as a as this medical sergeant and the, and he got his rank back I mean when he went back into the service they gave him the same rank that he had had as a marine for all these years and so he started over it was a pretty interesting guy uh, but he he was kind of a misfit I think in the army I mean he was he had more of a marine attitude about him and marines are pretty gung-ho so my relationship with him me being this conscientious objector who who barely squeaked by having to go to prison and then showing up without a weapon and with all my ideals and i i don't know why but he sort of took me under his wing i i think in the beginning he thought he could change me i think that's probably what it was about that i'll just whip this guy into shape and we'll you know, we'll slap the college off this guy real quick. And in the end, um, that that's not necessarily what happened. So, but he, yeah, he's the central character of the book. And I, uh, everyone who, who reads the book, I, I remember, you know, my editor spent, spent a long time with, I have a wonderful woman who, who, who edits for me, who, who kind of, changes my dangling modifiers and all the other stuff that I do. I write like I speak, and that, that's not always good for how it comes down in print. And she's really good about it. And she spent a lot of time, labor of love, over this thing. And at the end, we'd, we'd published it. It had gone off, and, it, and 
we were waiting for the for the first copies of the book to come back after sending them off for publishing. It takes about six months. And I talked to her. I hadn't talked to her. I mean, we'd been talking all the time while, during the time she's editing. And so a couple months had gone by, and I hadn't talked to her. And I I called her on the phone and said, "How you doing anyway? I haven't talked to you in a long time." And she said, "Great." And I said, "Well, how you feeling about things?" And she said, "I miss Smitty." <laughs> Because she just got to know him so well in this book. And a lot of people have said that. They've said, yeah. And it's very interesting that the one huge hawk figure in this in this story written by a conscientious objector would be the one character that that everybody really, really likes. But but I like him too. He's a he's a heck of a guy. Saved me a number of times. Did you ever speak with them after your no. tour? You know, the Army's a funny place. You you come and you go. You you get to know people really well, and then they get their orders for another camp, and you, you shake hands, you say goodbye, and say, we'll have to get, we'll have to hook up sometime, and you never do. It just, it, it's, uh, it's hard. It's hard. I, yeah, I, in fact, in the first book I wrote, um, first manuscript, I used his real name, and I put it out there just on, it was the only real name I used in the whole book. I put it out there on purpose because I wanted to find him. And I thought if he'd read this book or anybody else who knew him would read it, uh, maybe I could find him. He's about 12 years older than me, which would put him, you know, almost 70 now. And he was a chain smoker. And I don't know too many people who live past 60 if they smoke all the time. So I, there's a good chance he's not with us. But, yeah, I'd love to run into him again. The When the Random House book came out, they, they of course, changed every name in it. So it couldn't be anywhere, you're not even close to the to the original person. So I figured there were enough Smiths in the army and enough people called Smitty that I would keep that. That was his last name was Smitty, but the first names were changed just uh, for liability purposes and all. Yeah, I'd love to run into him. I have this fantasy, you know, I'm sitting on Oprah and talking about my book and, and she somehow has found him and out he comes. Yeah. First thing he'd do is probably slap me and tell me I got something wrong in the book. But Do you think based on your experiences that seeking out those that you served with is a desirable thing or is that something that one would avoid because of the memories that are tied into it no no I, no you don't avoid it for that reason you avoid it because we're not the same people I am not the person I was in that book one of the things my editor did was strip out every time I started talking like a 57 year old in this book uh, she took it out it's not relevant uh, I am not the 22, 23-year-old that, that is in this story. And all of the other ones who I was with, they are completely different people now. To to get together and reminisce, uh, I don't think it would bring out any any of, of what we went through at all. In fact, interestingly, I saw a guy who I was in basic training with who who graduated from the same high school as I. I just saw him three weeks ago at my 40th reunion and I had not seen him since the last day of basic training and he went to Vietnam also and we talked a little bit about our sergeant in basic training and some of the funny things that happened and and confessed some of our our own stupid mistakes um, didn't talk much about about Vietnam didn't really need to um, everything's pretty much been said about it it was nice to see him again I didn't know him all that well in high school. I played basketball, actually, on the same JV team as he, so we had some, logged some bus time together and all, but he wasn't my best friend or anything. It was a coincidence to get in the same basic training platoon with him. Uh, I was the platoon guide when I was in basic training, meaning I was the, the of all of the troops, I was the sort of made the sergeant. I was the guy who called the cadence when we marched, and I was in charge. I was the guy that the drill sergeant put in charge when he was gone. Interesting. They picked the one conscientious objector in the whole group to make the sergeant. But that just, that happened. And so my buddy, uh, Morgan, he he said, I just remember that you were a good platoon guy. It was fun because you, you sang great songs and we marched along. This That's all I remember of you is, is learning to march and having to get my feet on right and the songs that you made up and that we sang. And uh, he said, that's all I remember. And so... It was nice to see him, and I, I wouldn't mind seeing some of those guys again, but uh, not to rehash uh, what went on or what our memories of that were, because we were different kids then. You said earlier that the war in Vietnam, the war that you were in there, was 
a sniper war and a command detonated and that there were command detonated mines. Mm -hmm. Do you see a real, again, with our current situation in Iraq, that seems to describe oh, yeah. that situation? Yeah. And I'm not too sure because I don't study the war that much. I It just angers me so much that I can I can only take so much of it. But what I understand is that 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 some of what is being used against us is is ammunition dumps we left behind when we had to pull back. I mean, we went in thinking we were going to take this whole country over and set up all these strategic points and then had to and then we were run off of them. And so here they've got now they're bombing us with our own stuff, but ha what what the name that they used for it is a something device a uh, they don't call it command detonated they call it a um it, it's something like a handmade device or something i can i could look on my list of war dead and see what what it's called but in, wh what it means in essence is somebody has taken pieces and put them together and made a bomb out of them and so that with the suicide bombings but a lot of this is just putting pieces together and sitting a bomb out there and then Either something rolls over it and, and explodes it, or somebody's triggering it with a, a, you know, on command. When they see you right in the right position, they're triggering a bomb to go off. And with technology nowadays, you know, that's not that hard to do. Well, t technology is a lot more advanced than it was when I was in Vietnam. So they actually would have to get close enough to the to the command detonated mine that they could, you know, twist this electrical charge in their hand to connected by wires so when we got blown up there was somebody pretty close to us and then they would scoot off and get into a tunnel or do whatever that was why why we walk so far apart part of the reason you go through the jungle with with yards between you and the next guy is you want to be close enough where you can see him and the guy in front of you and behind you but you don't want to be close to them because if people bunch up then and you walk by a mind, that would be the time to release the mind to get as many as you can with one shot. Uh, when I see movies that of war movies, and I see them walking too close together, you know, my wife always laughs at me because I, I'm in my seat just squirming, and she's saying, "Are you doing it again?" And it's always because they're walking too close, and I say, God, "They're, they got to get apart." <laughs> you know, she says, "It's a movie. You know, leave it alone." <laughs> they had a camera shot. You know, it's it, and I yeah, but it's wrong. It's just wrong. <laughs> so watching movies can be tough for you at times. Yeah, yeah. Well, in the early days, um, I remember, you know, Deer Hunter came out, and it was one of the first that had anything about Vietnam in it. I I don't necessarily think that the Deer Hunter, the Russian roulette game, and all that kind of stuff is. I'm not sure how close to reality that is for anything that really happened. I. But the Deer Hunter movie, you know, I was at this Polish wedding in the movie, everybody dancing around, and then the next thing you know, we were in helicopters and blasting away, and I'm in a war zone with all the noise, and in a part of your memory, there are two things will bring your memory back, like nothing else, even more than visual, and that is the sound and the smell. And like I, when I'm behind a bus and smell diesel fuel, uh, a lot of Vietnam comes back to me. Uh, the I, I I can't like if I'm on a layover in an airport and want to just snooze, uh, I can't go to sleep in an airport because there's a faint enough diesel smell to the airport that if I go to sleep and dream, uh, you know, with that diesel fuel in my in my head, it's not good. It's not a good thing at all. So I will never ever sleep in an airport or on a plane for that matter. It's just a faint enough smell that comes in on people's clothes and stuff from the from the airport smell of of jet fuel and all those diesel um, uh, vehicles running around anyway I'm getting off the subject but but uh, those memories well, I, know, I can't remember what your question was right now but but um, yeah things will trigger um, what what um, uh, memories I guess that's what I was trying to answer and as well the local on television, news clips, things like that. Not so much. Not so much. The visual stuff didn't get me that much. Oh, I know what I was talking about. Sorry, I lost it there for a minute. I was talking about Deer Hunter. Yes. And when it, when all of a sudden this this battle started, uh, I was at the premiere of Deer Hunter at the big Fox Theater downtown in, in Los Angeles, in, in Hollywood, in Westwood. 
And that th theater is configured in a way that all of the audience is in the middle and the aisles are on the left and the right. And there are maybe 30 or 40 seats wide. And we were right down in the middle, about the seventh row back. And I somehow got from my seat out into the parking lot on my hands and knees without knowing how I got there. I must have just crawled right over people's laps. But I was in the middle. I mean, there were at least 20 people between me and the aisle. And and I, all I remember is a being in a Polish wedding in this movie. And the next thing, my girlfriend patting me on the back as I was on my hands and knees out in the parking lot. That's the next thing I remember. And so I, I saw Deer Hunter, the movie Deer Hunter, 10 years later uh, when I finally sat down with friends and said, okay, what happened? <laughs> Where did this movie go? And then I, I didn't really like the movie all that much, but... But that's how shocking it was. It hit me at a time when... And so by the time Platoon came out, I knew what Platoon was about, and I knew that it was directed, written and directed by a Vietnam vet. So I went to Platoon thinking... Well, in the meantime, I saw Apocalypse Now, and I didn't think it had anything to do with Vietnam at all. But I saw the whole movie. The, the boat scenes were pretty authentic, and the Martin Sheen thing of being out in the heat and the... Although nobody would be playing rock and roll music running down a river uh, and being exposed out there where snipers can hit you. That's not how we did it. We did it huddled behind armored boats, uh, afraid at any moment that anybody could shoot us. So that part was a little weird. Um, but when I saw Platoon, I went fully expecting it to be an authentic look at Vietnam. And uh, I liked the Oliver Stone treatment. I thought the plot was probably a little contrived in that this this thing between sort of the the alcohol drinkers and the dope smokers i that that was a little contrived although uh, and and maybe Oliver Stone took a little liberty there uh i I wasn't in that kind of a platoon that wasn't an issue for us uh, as a medic nobody was I wasn't going to let anybody smoke anything or drink anything when we were out in the in the field and we were on long missions so um but that wasn't going to happen not in our platoon anyway. That's just taking everybody's life in, in jeopardy. And so I thought that was a little loosey-goosey in, in platoon. But boy, the scenes, the way he looked through that camera and gave you the fear of walking in the dark at night and seeing people coming through the jungle and all that, boy, he really had it. I, I sat in that movie going, yeah. And, and you notice nowhere in platoon do people march anywhere close to each other as they're going through the jungle. They're like way spread out. And so all the really authentic stuff uh, I thought that Oliver just did an incredible job with that movie. If somebody wants to know what Vietnam was like, that's the movie to see. Um, plot aside and personalities aside, um, that's the one to see. One of the items in your book that stuck out for me on the first read was a term, D-O-W, died of wounds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us what that is? Well... Um, died of wounds is a, is an official. I mean, that's you have KIA killed in action. You have MIA missing in action, and you have died of wounds, which means someone was in the hospital later and and died of wounds that they had. So, the died of wounds is a statistic. What happened in Vietnam was that the that the press back home was um, every night reporting the casualties for that day. Well, they chose to report only the KIA. They didn't report any missing in action, and they didn't report any died of wounds. And their philosophy behind that was, and this has been written a lot about, I mean, people who were in the media in those days give reasons why this was so. They did it because an MIA could show up the next day or could just be somewhere else and might not have been captured or be a POW. There's another three-letter thing. Everything has three letters. Uh, a diet of wounds could be someone who had been in the hospital for months. And so the, so, so to give the, the listeners, the viewers, an accurate description of what was going on in the war that day, to add a diet of wounds to the numbers of KIAs of that particular day would give them not a real look at what was happening score-wise in the war that day. 
So all they reported was KIA. They didn't report DOW. Well, technically, a person has to be dead on arrival. There's another three letters, DOA, dead on arrival. They have to be dead on arrival to be a KIA. So if you've got helicopters out in the field bringing people back in to surgical hospitals, and I was at a, surg at a surgical evac hospital out in the field, and the part in my book that talks about this is that here these helicopters came and they had bodies with them, and the bodies were ambulatory people who were walking wounded, um, people on stretchers who were critically wounded, people who were dead already. And as the stretchers came off the helicopters, there was a little uh, sort of a sorting area, a, a triage, if you will, that we were, my job, standing there at the beginning when I was in this evac hospital, uh, we'd come off of an evac helicopter and they needed more help and they said, just stand here and, and send the people who need the immediate help over this direction and get the ambulatories over here so we can get some medics to help them or someone else to help them. And if someone's dead, you got to make that determination right then. If they can't be helped or can't be revived, if they're just gone, then that is a KIA and send them over this direction. Well, somebody's counting all that. When I got back into the tent where the doctors were, the doctors had been given orders that if anybody comes into the tent who is critically wounded but is not dead, if they're still alive in any way, then they will be listed as a DOA if they later expire. Even if they're really critical and the doctors lose them in five minutes, that won't be a KIA, that will be a DOA. So, or I mean, that will be a um, diet of wounds, D-O-W. So there you have it. So then the news that goes back to America to be read at night only contains the ones who were technically called killed in action, not the ones who were called died of wounds. Well, we had helicopters getting people back to the hospitals within sometimes 15 minutes. And we had a whole lot of people who arrived still alive who died within the first half hour hour. And those were not included in the nightly news because they weren't. And that's when people talk about media and about choosing statistics and what they, sh they choose to share with you and what they don't choose to share with you, there's just one more evidence of how what the media wanted was for one reason, what the army wanted to tell them was for a whole different reason, and it was just manipulated numbers. And s reading something like that made me question even more the information we're getting out of Iraq. Well, yeah, I'm, yeah, you know, we're just born to question. I, I don't know. I don't trust it. Um, I know that, that when I was in Vietnam, General Westmoreland had asked for numbers. And, and he wanted to tell Lyndon Johnson that we were winning this war. And if you ever added up how many Vietnamese we killed in Vietnam War, we killed every man, woman, and child about four times. And then there was this whole myth about, well, they're sending all these Chinese people down to Vietnam to fight the war. That's not even true. The, the communist Chinese did not participate in the war. And then there was myths about insurgents or, or uh, militants coming over from Cambodia or Laos or even Thailand and being mercenaries. It's just not true. It just didn't happen. So if you go back and add up the numbers and what the population of Vietnam was, and you say how many we lost, 58,000 something, and how many they lost, you know, millions, when you start adding up all of the numbers that came back, it just doesn't figure. It just doesn't work. So it, we, what the bottom line is, um, Westmoreland wanted to tell Johnson and later, later Abrams wanted to tell Nixon that we were winning the war. And so every time we crossed a river, somebody called the kill in, you know, it just make them happy, make the generals happy, make the colonels happy, to call in kills. If it's even, if you saw something move and shot at it and it didn't move again, call it in. When did you start getting involved with other groups here to uh, talk about your experiences and or current policy? A year ago, a year and a half ago, before the Iraq War. 
I have I never been in a protest in my life. Never joined any group. Uh, came back from Vietnam. Didn't talk about it with anybody. Didn't tell anybody I was a conscientious objector. Even when people were still protesting the war, when I came back, I stayed away. To me, the protests were more like a love-in. You know, they were just all part of the 60s and the 70s and people going down there and gathering because it was the thing to do and the place to be. I didn't think that people in their heart had the conviction. I wasn't pro-war in any way. I wasn't trying to protect my fellow soldiers or something from the from the, all these protests and all. But I didn't participate in anything. I didn't participate during the Desert Storm thing. I... Um, you know, I mean, I vote every time, but I was never involved. And this Iraq war, to me, from the very beginning, was so different, was so much more like Vietnam than it was like anything else we'd experienced. The, the Desert Storm thing ended quickly. It didn't continue back down into Baghdad. We, we pushed people out of Kuwait. We, in essence took an elephant gun and, you know, shot a mouse with it. We did so much so quickly, so fast, and the Army was left alone to do their job. Uh, Storm and Norman Schwarzkopf and his Army um, very quickly um, were able to dispatch uh, an enemy back out of Kuwait and back. Um, that was what was in people's minds when this Iraq thing started. And to take over a whole country is a lot different than pushing a, an occupying force out of an occupied country. To take over an entire country, uh, and I going into it, I just thought, this is just sick and wrong. There, There is... They have no idea what they're getting into here, and I didn't see any kind of policy or... Uh, or strategy or or exit strategy I, I just the more I heard and this business of of not trusting the words of the UN weapons inspectors who'd been there a lot not trusting people diplomats who'd been in the country a long time uh, agreeing with people that Saddam Hussein was a terrible dictator but looking at at a world where there were terrible dictators all over the place. We're not doing anything about Sudan, uh, Sudan, and what's going on there is just atrocious. And to see, I just smelled a rat, and um, I got involved. I got involved with the saw a person at a table out in front of the bookstore where I live, and they were signing people up for a pe peacemakers group, and and I. I gave him 10 bucks and said, yeah, put my name in the newspaper. I think this war's wrong. And that was like my first act ever of being against something, you know, that, that in a protest way. And, uh, and then I got involved with this veterans group and saw that here were a people, a lot of people just like me who have been to war, who know, who know what goes on in a war, who are not in any way anti-American, or unpatriotic. In fact, it was the, one of the most patriotic groups you want to find. Uh, but who say part of being patriotic and loving your country is standing up like Teddy Roosevelt said, when the president is not doing what is in the best interest of the people, that it's up to the people to stand up and stop him. I mean, that was said by a sitting president. Uh, and he was challenging people that if you don't like my policies and don't like what I'm doing, then it is your responsibility, not just your right, but your responsibility to bring that to my attention. Otherwise, I'm a dictator. And, I mean, that comes from a sitting president. And that's a very patriotic idea, is to stand up and say, you are not doing these things for the right reasons, and you're not doing it in my name as, quote, we the people. I mean, you're not. This is wrong for we the people. And uh, I feel extremely patriotic in doing that, uh, even more so because I'm a person who has seen a war firsthand. And the people who planned and plotted this war have not. And they frankly don't know what they're talking about. And they don't know what they're doing between you and me and everyone listening. I just don't think they know what they're doing. I don't think they had a strategy in the first place. They had an anger. 
They had a um, they had a plan about a whole area. I think it comes from a very very narrow view of the world. I think it comes from a I would even say a religiously bigoted uh, look at the world. I think they truly believe that that every Muslim everywhere hates us. Uh, I think they're unwilling to say that, but I think that's what they believe. I think their their ideas are backward. I think they represent America when all of America doesn't should not be represented in that way. I think they represent Christianity when all Christianity should not be represented that way. I think they represent a very narrow, um, fundamentalist, um, Armageddon fear based view of a very small group of Christians who believe that even if the world comes to an end, that Jesus himself will come down and pick them up and all their friends and take them to a, the kingdom in the sky. And that, although that is a part of the Christian belief system, it is a very, very narrow, radical view to believe that we humans will have anything to do with that whatsoever. That it will this that Armageddon will happen when when God wants it to happen, not when we force it. Um, and I just think it's it, that we don't we don't really get how bad uh, it's gone, how far it's how far it's gone. He doesn't even represent Republicans. There are are lots of really good Republicans out there who come from, he doesn't, he doesn't represent conservatives. He's not conservative when it comes to economy or ecology. He is, I mean, why would, uh, why would a conservative um, give tax breaks, especially to people who already have money? That's not a conservative economic policy. Why would a conservative, uh, destroy um, the land to seek uh, oil. I mean, why, why would a conservative wouldn't do that? Not, not the Republican conservatives I know. I was raised by two Republicans, and I'm offended by what a small, very narrow group of, of right-wing religious, what I would call zealots, have done to dishonor the Republican Party. And it's only because the entire middle has shifted so far to the right that they can even get away with it. So now you are going out using your book and talking with groups like high school students? Yeah, I've been invited to high schools. I, they invite me to talk about Vietnam. They want to talk about Desert Storm, I, I mean, Iraq. They want to talk about what's going on now with their war, and I don't mind doing that. I take with me a scroll of the dead to roll out across the front row of the class. It used to roll out. Now, now it goes wall to wall and a little further. Um, I take pictures of, of dead soldiers, show the students so we should, they can take one home each. Uh, so I talk a little bit about Vietnam, talk a little bit about war, and then I... And then when they want to talk about Iraq, I roll this thing out, and then I stop talking. I try to, I try to keep my, my part to 20 minutes or less because I'm usually there either 50 or 90 minutes, and I really want to hear what they have to say. And I've heard some incredible things from, from students. Um, they they are a lot more with it than we would guess, and they ask very real questions about just about the whole solving of international problems and they they want to know things and they're studying this stuff and the and the teachers are trying to get them to go and do their book learning uh, to back up what their things are but boy this generation just moves so fast you know they get on the internet and they see three things and they've decided what their whole life philosophy is and and then the next day they see three more things and that changes of course but i'm very impressed with how um, i'm not bringing any information to them i know better than that the information is free. It's out there. They can get it anywhere they want to. And they've got so much more information running around in their heads. And they can remember so much more than I can that I'm really just kind of catalyzing a conversation. They get to talk to somebody who was in a real war. So that's important. They like to do that. They like to see it in real 
terms rather than just print on a page somewhere. Uh, and that generates some pretty good conversations. Um, I've been to some interesting places, uh, uh, inner city, uh, urban Seattle High School, Mercer Island High School, Squim. Uh, did, did high schools out in Squim were uh, much more pro-military out there. Um, so, yeah, I'm liking it. I, I'll go anywhere anybody invites me. It's, it's great stuff. And I also recommend that they, you know, for next fall, the people who are asking me to come next fall, I'm asking them to, to use my book as a supplementary reading first because it reads real fast. It's pretty cheap. The book's seven bucks a piece, and they can get it for a lot. They probably get about 40% off if they buy it directly from Random House. So it's a, it's a book that's inexpensive. They can buy a, a classroom set and then pass it out, and the students seem to read this thing really fast. So uh, they can, I mean... Young people, 17, 18 year olds can read it in a day and a half. You know? So so that means that when they come back to the class, they have a discussion that involves everybody. Uh, one of the history teachers told me that this first time ever in his whole 18 or whatever years of, study, of teaching that he has had a whole class read an assignment literally overnight and come in wanting to talk about it then rather than waiting a week until I was going to arrive. They wanted it right then. He said, I had to put them off for a whole week and say, no, we're going to talk about this because the author's coming. And they were like, to heck with the author. We want to talk about it now. So that that's a good sign that it's a, that it's a good read and it's a fast read. It's easy read. And uh, they were kind of the target in my writing was I wanted to get this out to the draftable ages, you know. There's a Chinese curse of what I've heard called May You Live in Interesting Times, which I think we do. And I heard you speak the other night uh, here at the university bookstore, and you talked about, I believe, that your life had a certain degree of synchronicity. And you had used an example of the way the, a photo of you mm-hmm. landed on the cover of your book. Mm-hmm. It was completely... In, on some levels by chance. I'm wondering if um, you feel that that synchronicity and your own sense of hope maybe for solving our world's problems are, are aligning here because in some ways we're looking at the current conflict in Iraq. We can't keep having conflicts like this with the level of weapons that we have now. Um, I guess I'm getting at. I'm wondering if you are hopeful that we might be at a turning point in terms of a uh, of a species and a civilization. Well, one would hope. I wrote um, I wrote a note to my daughter when she was born and put it in a suitcase for her to open when she left to uh, college. And I and I kept putting things in there for about the first ten years of her life. Her little uh, package. And uh, one of the things that I wrote in there in 1985 when Amy was born was in that note was that I hoped that by the time that she got to college uh, that the concept of war was um, old and retired and that we had, that not that we didn't disagree with people, but that we had found another way to solve our our disagreements rather than weapons and and killing and mass killing and and war and that I that I think I said in the letter uh, I, I want I want you to think about war the way I think about cannibalism or something else that's just so weird but you know cannibalism isn't that old I mean it was still around just you know a couple two three generations ago but but nowadays you know you think Oh my gosh! <laughs> how, how ridiculous! How could anybody eat another human being? You know, well, I'd like it to be ridiculous. I would love that to happen. Well, she's a freshman in college now, and and my prediction was wrong. My hope w- didn't happen. I, in f- some ways, I just feel like a a terrible failure in this generation that we that we that we just haven't learned anything, and I'm I'm willing to be a failure tomorrow again and just keep going out and failing every day. But I do feel a lot like we haven't learned the lesson we were sent here to learn. 
Now, I have some pretty mystic friends who talk about the age of Aquarius and the, the turning and the the flipping of the polars and all, uh, all <laughs> the polar caps and all that stuff. But I feel inside me that we certainly have the potential. Robert Mueller, when he came and spoke to a group here in, in Seattle right after the Iraq War started and right after all the protests happened all over the world, this bright light came in, and, and here he was talking to peace at activists who, of course, were just down in the dumps because here they'd been out on the street and they'd done their signs and they'd written their letters and they'd been on phone banks to senators and they'd done everything they could to avoid this thing happening. And they felt like it's just such a stupid thing. Why are we doing this? And then here we went. There were the bombs. They just went ahead and did it. And so ever, all of us were just feeling terribly depressed. And he came in saying, isn't this a great day? Isn't this an astonishing revelation uh, for us as Americans? And we were like, what? Uh, are you nuts? And he said, for the first time in the history of mankind, we have the entire world in a dialogue about peace. And everyone just kind of took a breath. And then he said, now, we need to be sure that we keep America, the United States of America, in that dialogue. Because right now, the rest of the world doesn't think we're in that dialogue. They're thinking that we all are behind this, this warfare thing. So we have to be sure to do our part. But whether we want it or not, the whole rest of the world right now um, is talking about peaceful solutions. Uh, so there's hope. There's hope. Uh, someone told me once that, that George W. prays every night and that he asks God for his guidance. Well, I think, what if? What if there is a God? What if there's a great creator who is saying, okay, George, I'm going to use you to once and for all and finally get humankind to reject the notion of war. And so do what I tell you. I mean, well, there's a concept. He's using him and using him hard. Uh, if you're a religious person, that can, that can give you the shivers, you know, to think, hmm. But if you go back to your Old Testament or the Koran and read the way those people thought the Creator actually worked, how the Great Spirit worked, there's some pretty bad stuff in there. I mean, this is a creator that works with hurricanes and tornadoes and great floods. And, and you know, when he wants to get your attention, look out. And I think the synchronicity thing that I was talking about the other night is a gentler uh, aha. And when, when the creator or the creation sets up things so that you, you are reminded and I'm reminded by synchronicities. I'm reminded when one and two and three and four synchronicities at four different levels happen around the same subject. And it's like I'm being bit, beaten in the temple, you know, something smacking me saying, will you please pay attention today? I'm, I'm giving you all these signs. Will you please pay attention? I think, yeah, okay. Uh, what what was it again I was supposed to be paying attention? Please remind me. But I, it doesn't take long to just back up a little, look at the landscape and say, oh, okay, uh, I'm being reminded that uh, these are the things that are important to do. Uh, and I don't need to be angry to do them. I don't need to be excited to do them. I need to get up every morning and take a big breath and do the right things that day. And that if I do, I will be taken care of. And that I, and if we all do, uh, we will move toward what promises to be a much better solution than those solutions that we have so far. And that we, that we shouldn't be depressed about it. We should have hope about it. The way Robert Mueller said to us, don't be depressed. Here, here you see that maybe you don't have control over this, but you don't, maybe you don't, aren't supposed to have. Maybe you're supposed to be in a more chaotic, 
um, environment at this port at this particular time in order to bring order later it has to be stirred and you're t we have to get your attention again you are being too complacent and so now we're getting your attention big time and getting the whole world's attention uh, there are a lot of nations out there who have been making decisions about who they are and what they are based upon what America has done uh, interesting hmm uh, the UN all of a sudden became way more important. Uh, interesting. Hmm. Uh, not complacent anymore, that's for sure. Oh, anyway. We've just been talking with Ben Sherman. He is author of the book Medic, the story of a conscientious objector in the Vietnam War.